Hey, Black family, what's up? This is Super Mike. Uh, today, we're going to deal with a little issue that I have about uh, the image of the black man. One of the things that uh, the enemy does, which a lot of people call it white supremacy. Of course, they're not supreme uh, in, in their make, in their being. But they are supreme in this situation in the current power dynamic that they have uh, that we can perceive i should say and they've had for a while but one of the things that they do the greatest power of our enemy is not their ability to kill and murder us and that's a big misconception uh, their greatest power is not in their finances their greatest power is their ability to deceive us, to trick us, to manipulate our minds, because that allows them to use us as agents against ourselves and against our own interest. And that allows them to even use other segments of society. So the part of that deception that I'm going to kind of touch on today is the perception of the black American man as number one, a criminal, a coward, a low life, good for nothing, as a waste, as weak, as stupid, as immoral. Okay. So, we're just going to deal with that. And that's why I have the, that's why I have the, the words here, just showing how black men, we are heroic by nature, but dusty by circumstances. And when you're in a situation like we are in the United States of America, in many parts of the planet, but especially in the United States of America. And we have been in a situation where we have been studied, we have been experimented on uh, from our physical being to our mental state. They've had opportunity to teach techniques on how to uh, control us uh, so they can control us with systems of control, our religion, their religion, and our religion, which is our spiritual sp spiritual uh, focus. Uh, they have systems of control with their government, their law, their police, and the uh, law enforcement wings. Systems of control with their science, and their scientific community. Because, unfortunately, their education is what gives us perceptions of our definitions. And um, sometimes we get arrogant in our education, trying to be like them, because many times they act arrogant. And uh, we miss a lot of information, because we sometimes, when we get a little bit of education, we... Uh, we don't seem to want to, uh, we seem to want to teach more than we want to learn more. Okay. And that is probably a problem there. And so what we want to do here is we want to learn, uh, we're analyzing a little bit of information. So this here is, uh, Angel Granados Diaz is 18. This is the young dude out there in Portland, Oregon at, uh, Park Rose High School, uh, from the reports. Think he had a bad week. He broke up with his girlfriend. The dude's mentally unstable. In his mind, he he had a shotgun somewhere. He got the shotgun, brought it to school, and um, according to the students, that he was intending on harming himself and killing himself in front of others. And so, you know, now you you're dealing with a school shooting situation. Okay. Now, 
let's look at the difference in uh, responses. The way uh, the nature of the white man that respond to something like this, we see these type of pictures. We see stuff like uh, we see. I'll do pictures like that. You know, look at these police officers. They got tactical gear, armor, body armor, millions of guns. I mean, if you look at some of the response, if you just Google it, some of the response of the police, the police response guns. So what they do is they respond gun for gun. And that's important. We need to know that. We need to know that. But at the same time, what was the root problem? So I want to go into how this was done. Well, let's look at this part first. Let's look at this. So, at this time, you at this time, people are being called. The, the authorities are being called. They're coming in with tactical gear, uh, shotguns, snipers, you know, bomb squad, negotiating tactics, all these type of issues. So we want to go it's through a this. Powerful moment. A coach embraces a student. Who he just disarmed. So let's KBW look at this. News Listen to the news KBW reporter. Just into the newsroom shows a powerful moment. A coach embraces a student who he just disarmed. That team brought a rifle into Park Rose High School back in May. And this is our first look at how this came to a peaceful end. Thank you for joining us. I'm Laurel Porter. And I'm Dan Haggerty. The Multnomah County District Attorney's Office. They look, look at the look at the white man's response. Look at the money, wages. We're looking at all the wages. We're looking at all the money. Just release this surveillance video. How they walk in? They guard in. Now, you can see the Park Rose student, Angel Granados Diaz, okay. walk into the high school with the shotgun hidden under something in his arms. Moments later, he nearly bumps into football coach Keenan Lowe, who doesn't seem to notice a thing, but it stops the teen in his tracks. The video shows Lowe make his way down the hall and Granados Diaz make his move, popping into frame a short time later. Within seconds, we see the panic that haunts parents and students as we watch kids burst through doors and sprint frantically towards Frantic. the Frantic. A teacher runs into the hall and then you see the gun. Keenan Lowe is holding it in his right hand, backs away from the student, then embraces him in a hug. Another teacher grabs the shotgun as Lowe keeps a tight hold of the student. We can see the two talking and hugging. The teacher who took the gun calls police, who enter a short time later with their Look at the police. Drawn. They find the teens. Look at the police. <laughs> guns. Now, sometimes you need those guns, but this is what I wanted to see. This source. That boy obviously is mentally unstable. If that teacher with that mindset were not there, the boy would have probably killed himself or the cops would have killed him because everybody else ran. That was their first instinct. But let's listen to the mindset of this teacher here. This is the coach. Staff there. Uh, I've only been at, at Park Road. Keenan, getting Keenan, back to school know. today, man. What was the, the feelings for you to be back in that place? Uh, today was a good day. Uh, you know, I, I showed up today. What I don't like is how this reporter calls this man by his first name. That's To me, that's disrespectful because he didn't ask him to respect this man. This is a man. But they tend to do that to us. Because, you know, the kids, right, and the staff there, 
Uh, I've only been at, at Park Rose for for a year now, um, and I've, I've grown to, to love that place and love those kids at that school. Um, it's a special place, a special school. A lot of kids that, that, you know, have grown up in a rough way. You know, a lot of kids that, you know, have had nothing given to them in life. So I think that's why I was attracted to that school and that, that football coaching job. And, uh, you know, that's why I love these kids. Dame and the Blazers reached out to you uh, to get tickets the night, Saturday, the day after, and then again tonight. What's it mean to have some relief and some, some getaway time here and enjoy your football players? Man, it's awesome. It's awesome. Uh, as you can imagine, it's been, it's been a tough tough weekend for, for for all of us, really. You know, everybody in, in Oregon and, and a lot of people around the country. Um, I've been getting a lot of love from, from from all around the country because this is this is such a you know a story that that usually ends in tragedy. And this is this is you know from God's will that this this ended up well. You know, it was it's a scary. I want you to pay attention as well. He uses the word God. So this man is spiritual, a spiritual person. Situation, um, you know, we were in the headlines, but we were in the headlines, and it wasn't a tragedy. So that I'm just thankful for that. What, how did you find your? How did you find yourself in the classroom that day? Like how you got to the classroom from where you were in the school and all that? Can you walk us through kind of what happened real quick? Yeah. So I, I mean, there's there's the main building at Park Rose, and then there's the Fab building, the Fine Arts building, which is a little walk, uh, kind of walk past the football field. So. Um, you know, I walk out there, I get a call to, to go grab a student. Um, you know, I get 30, 40 calls every day to just grab random students to take them down to the office and, you know, pass messages, deliver notes, all that stuff. Uh, so it's just another random, you know, regular call uh, to go grab a student out in the fab building. And, uh, you know, I walk in there, I get to the classroom. Um, you know, it's, I'm in the classroom for, for 15, 20 seconds. You know, I, I ask the teachers, this is the student here, we kind of look around. Uh, students not there. Um, you know, after about after I'm in the classroom for, for 20 seconds, um, the door opens and you know I'm I'm within arm's length of the door. Uh, you know, about three feet away from the door, and and the uh, you know there's there's a, a kid with a gun, a shotgun. Uh, as soon as that door opens, so um, pretty crazy situation. You know, in a fraction of a second, uh, I analyzed everything really fast. I saw it, look in his face, look in his eyes, looked at the gun, and realized it was a real gun. And then my instincts just took over. Um, you know, I, I lunged for the gun, put two hands on the gun, and, and he had his two hands on the gun. And obviously the, the students are, you know, you know, running out of the classroom and, and screaming. And, um, you know, I'm just making sure that barrel of the gun is, isn't pointing towards them or towards me. And, um, you know, I was able to, to rest a little way and, and uh, you know, kind of save the day. Everyone's using the word hero, and rightfully so. I mean, from our perspective. All right, so we want to stop that there. And, of course, this is all fair use. I'm going to go try to say I'm stealing your stuff. It's all fair use for educational purposes. But, yeah, family, we want to make sure we understand that. I mean, that's a black man in Oregon, you know. That's a brother. But if you notice, the point, the problem is these kids have a lot of pressure on them. There's a lot of uh, insane rules that are happening in schools, and um, they a lot of kids are not used to. There's a lot of access to weapons. Um, there's less spiritual uh, edification in the community. And even though some of you guys don't understand the value of spiritual education or edification, it's important. Spiritual edicate, ed, uh, edification is extremely important for the human being, okay? We're complicated beings. And so we have a lot of thoughts, a lot of questions, and we can become dangerous if we don't have a foundation. And so that's another point that I'm dealing with. So, but what I wanted to do too is go through a couple of other things. Now, there's a black man, he's a hero. Let's go through another one. And let's see here. This guy here, Charles, is back when uh, El Paso shooting. Glendon Oakley, I mean, sorry. Glendon Oakley, Jr. 
And of course, according to the article, in what seems like the hundredth time, America was shaken to the core by another mass shooting in El Paso, Texas. And this particular brother, he made it uh, made it a point to save children. It's a lot of children that were looking for their parents; they were getting shot. The parents were, and the brother saved the children, which is pretty much natural for people to do what it's natural for the black man to do. It's natural for the black man to want to do. You want to save people. And that's just pretty much natural. Now, there's some circumstances that create a lot of warped people, but that's what we do naturally. Let's go through this one. This brother. Dimitri, uh, Dominic uh, Dozier, I think his name is, Rogier, Dominic Rogier. This enemy, this demon, went to shoot up the Kroger over there in, uh, in Kentucky. This was back in 2018, October, and at, in Jefferson Town, Kentucky, a man opened fire on people he didn't even know. He tried to get into church prior to that, according to reports. But the door was locked because of previous church shootings by suspected white tem white supremacist terrorists. And he decided he wanted to go out and he wanted to shoot black people. He killed a couple of people. This brother and his family happened to be inside the church, inside the uh, store, Kroger. Brother had a gun on him. He returned fire. The coward, white supremacist, terrorist, <laughs> he didn't expect that, so he runs back away. He runs away in the parking lot. Uh, I think there was a, a white guy that had a gun, and he begged him not to shoot him. But the point is, uh, you know, there's another brother. And he just was defending his family. And no telling, he saved a lot of people because he challenged this enemy. Here's another one. So what we want to do with Fort Hood, this is about 10 years ago. Fort Hood, the... Okay, in the Fort Hood situation, you had a, a Arab uh, doctor who was a psychologist, I believe. He was in, this Arab doctor, he was a uh, task. <laughs> he was out there trying to, because when some of these uh, soldiers and uh, Marines go over to these places in Middle East, Iraq, Iran, or uh, Syria and Libya, I mean, they commit all kind of just evil murderous acts, rapes, murders, just killings for no reason, kids, babies, they get used to it, so they do all this stuff, and then when they come back over here, they're all traumatized, because they're starting to realize what they did, and they're all disturbed by it, and of course, you're in civilization now, you can't do that anymore, so this doctor, he was an Arab guy, his name was uh, Nidal, something, what was his name? Nidal Hassan. He was a doctor in Fort Hood. He's the doctor snapped. The psychologist snaps, and so he goes to killing the the soldiers. He goes to killing the white guys in in the base. So, you know, he kills a few of them. He's moving different spots. This particular lady, she was a sergeant of the police. I guess that's the MPs, but she's a policewoman. She tried. They made her the hero, complete hero at first. But this dude, Todd, and he's just looking down all. He actually is is the one that neutralized um, Nidal because she had got shot and would have died if he if he had not killed the guy. So even in this particular article, she's actually kind of centered. She's kind of centered as the hero. 
and uh, so just as the last mass shooting in Fort Hood massacre, uh, when the government confronted by a brave policewoman, she confronted him. It was clearly heroic what she did. You know, Lieutenant Mark Miley said of the officer in more recent horror. Hopefully the still unidentified hero in this week's attack will be treated better than the Fort Hood Police Sergeant Kimberly Munley after the massacre in 2009. She was shot three times and flatlined twice at the hospital. So she was about to die. And uh, pretty much this is a rare picture where they actually showed the brother there. Because this is the man that actually killed Nidal and saved her too. Uh, so, yeah, Senior Sergeant uh, Todd is the one that actually killed the dude. Shot him nine times. So she did her uh, protest loudly when the military victims of, of the shootings were denied combat benefits and Purple Hearts because the Army classified the incident as a workplace violence rather than a terrorist attack. And so you see how perception is very important to them. They, the Army classified this incident as a workplace violence rather than a terrorist attack. So, you know, and this is, this is word magic. In Black America, we really got to understand this. Perception is is a form of what we call magic. It's something that is just used, spoken over and over again. But it creates perceptions in people's minds, and those and any perception in the mind of a human being can actually be brought to reality. It needs to be dealt with. And so, yeah, this is Mark uh, Mark Todd. This is the actual one who neutralized the Fort Hood uh, killer, Hassan. And let's go to another one. This particular brother, James, James Shaw, he, there was a Waffle House massacre. <laughs> Another suspected white supremacist wanted to kill everybody at Waffle House, shoot people at Waffle House and rob folks. And so the brother uh, decided to fight him. So the brother decided to fight him and won. The brother did not have a gun. And he could have tried to run away, but he decides to fight him. So let's listen to him. And uh, he worked for AT&T, but, you know, I think they don't want him to work there anymore. So anyway, let's listen to some of this here. So uh, AT&T has been very understanding right now. They have me on disability leave, and we're trying to find me a job. My cust my job was very customer orientated, and uh, the highlight that I have now is not very, uh, not a great idea. I think in AT&T thing um, for me to go in someone's home or business. Um, because people think I have that in my bank account right now, right. or they think I have that in the hospital or something like that. So liability for AT and T is not looking good. So we're looking at different avenues that um, I can work in with AT and T, or um, even if I do leave, um, it'll be something like um, maybe I, you know, be an inspirational speaker or motivation. Or um, to be honest with you, I didn't even know I I, I spoke as as good as people tell me I do. But <laughs> It's just something that, you know, I, I just, I just, I guess I just came with, I guess. So that's important. So we have a lot of stuff in us as black men. There's a lot of power in the black man. But our circumstances are not available for us to bring that power out of us. Okay, you need a, you need a circumstance to, to for you to fight against. So what this enemy is doing is creating a situation where we don't want to fight. So that's their magic. They need to create a situation where we don't even want to fight. That's the that's that's the ticket. And so drugs, that's what the weed is for, that's what 
the music is for, that's what the entertainment is for, that's what the jokes are for. It's all about jokes, playing, avoidance. There's a lot of people who want to avoid this kind of subject. They don't want to think like this. They don't want to think this deep because we're so ready for instant gratification. In this this particular situation that we're in is it's long term. It takes a long, detailed uh, struggle, internal and external, in order to clear up the stuff that we're dealing with here. So. We want to deal with our circumstances. And let's go through another one. Let me go through this. This is my boy Charles, Charles Ramsey. This man, <laughs> I mean, this is the black man. He's just natural. He ain't trying to be no hero, but he, he was a hero. He is a hero. He saved, uh, he saved the, uh, some girls, some white girls, Amanda, Barry, Michelle Knight, and I mean this this Mexican white supremacist, he kidnaps these women and have have them as sex slaves in the basement of his house for ten years. <laughs> this is crazy. Let's listen to Charles Ramsey. Funny. Great interview. But in about a year ago, yeah. you'd seen Ariel Castro around, right? When I moved there only because he was my neighbor. Right. You know what I mean? What was he like? Cool. He, he wasn't no freak of nature. He was like me and you, because he talked about the same thing you were talking about. Right. He talked about you, you know what I mean? You know, regular stuff, bro. So so yesterday, what happened? Uh-oh. Yeah, you don't know this. I don't give a tell at all. <clears throat> Around 3 o'clock, I was on my porch, and the mailman put his mail in my mail. So I looked at it and was like, oh, I gotta get here goes the mail when he come home. A couple minutes later, he pulled up. He checked the mailbox, grabbed his mail. Before he went in the house, I said, Ariel, here go your mail. And we just had the same conversation when I handed him the mail. He said, they can't get it right. Yeah. I said, no, damn postal service. That's it. He left. I jumped on my bike, went to McDonald's, came back home. I'm in my house, but I'm in the living room, and I'm right by the front door. I'm looking out the front door. And man, this girl screamed like a car had hit a kid, which made me, you know, you stop eating. You know what the hell was that? You know that that. So when I got up, I saw this my neighbor across the street. He run across the street, and I'm like, well, where? I'm thinking, well, where are you going? There ain't nobody next door because I just saw Ariel Lee. Mm -hmm. and I know ain't nobody over there. I heard that girl scream and, and saw him run across the street, and I went outside and, and wondered what he was doing. And it's a, the girl, Amanda say. I'm stuck in here. Help get me out. So he either don't know English that well or panic. Well, he just looked at me and was like, he's a girl. And that's all he did. So here I come with my, you know, half eaten big man. And I look and I say, well, what's up? And she like, I've been trapped in here. And he won't let me out. It's me and my baby. I say, well, you ain't got to talk no more. Come on. And I'm trying to get the door open and can't. Because it's the he didn't torture chamber did some kind of way and lock it up, right? So I'm did what I had to do and kicked the bottom of uh, the door and she crawled out of it. She grabbed her baby and threw me off. All right, we're fine. I got some girl and her kid. And what did she look like? I mean, what, what was she wearing? Uh, jumpsuit. Uh, she had a white uh, tank top on, rings on, mascara. You know, she was well groomed. She didn't like, she didn't look like she was kidnapped. That's what I'm saying. Mm. That's what threw me off. When well, she was like, I'm in here trapped. And I'm like, well, you don't look like kidnapped. So maybe you got a boyfriend problem. <laughs> anyway, I love that brother. No, but as a hero, by nature, we want to do good by nature. So what's stopping us? And uh, actually, what I want this is Bass Reeves. You know, that's another brother. That's a hero. Bass Reeves. But uh, I think I'm going to end this up. But the point is on this, on this subject is, you know, we, you got to deal with what you call potential and or you got to deal with 
un with released power. Okay, and so we as black people as a group, we, there's certain principles that you must uh, you must follow in order to gain power as a group. Okay, and what your enemy's job is to do, because your enemy, I don't care, just, even if it's a hundred million of them, they're old. And if it's 40 million of us, we're mostly young. They don't want to fight you. You're already in the country. They don't want to fight you. You got to think about it. The fighting people, the white man's nature is, is, is conquer, is destruction, is domination through un fair practices okay you know our nature is straightforward we want the truth we want to be, just ha uh, have a fair shape our nature is survival okay but you got the white man or the white supremacist power structure when i say white man i'm talking about the power structure that is resulting from their you know, hundreds of years of stealing, okay, from us and from others all around the world. And this is a system that they depended on for their comfort. So now when we decide we want to change, because this system is hurting us, they have to fight you. Because when they, because if we become comfortable with the system that we're comfortable with, they can't, they can't live anymore. They can't let you go. Because if they let you go, then who else are they going to steal from? Yeah, that's who they steal from. They steal from us. Okay? And if you end up controlling your own resources, then they can't call you dusty. They can't call you, They you know, they got our women hating us. I mean, there's, I mean, there's, we, we continuously violate uh, our women because, I mean, we're, as a, as a group, black men, we have not been able to exercise the type of power that we know we should have. And so we don't get the respect that we should have. And now the white supremacists have elevated your woman in power. So now she's she's a match for you. She's able to disrespect you as well. And so, you know, where are you gonna go to feel man to feel manly, to feel like a man, to feel like you have some power in this world. You see, and that is a key component of manhood because uh masculinity. A mas a masculine man is is moved in his spirit to create a sphere of power for himself and for his family. And if he can't create that, he's going to be frustrated. Now, we have that phony type of power, which means a violent type of power that you lord over your women and over your children. And that's fake power. That's not real. And so I do support the women. It is correct for us not to be able to, uh, you know, exercise that type of phony power pimping power and all that mess so the only way we can the path that we must go on is the path of resistance we have to <laughs> we got to go for the real you know we got to secure ourselves a situation where we can begin to grow our society and protect our society and be men in our society Okay, that's the only way. This is the only way. And uh, it, you should expect your enemy to resist that. So the first way they're going to resist it is with their soft power. Like with the games, with the tricks, with the lies. But when you you resist that, so now they got to come and attack you. So And that's what's happening now to us. So anyway, that's pretty much all I'm going to do tonight. You gotta go out here and make me some money. That's a whole nother subject. Alright, family. Peace.